If you are a young woman like me who has grown up in a city or traveled to another, you might have been warned about steering off certain areas of the city because they were deemed not safe. What lends safety to urban areas is a matter of data and statistics, but it is also often subjective, relying heavily on how one feels while traversing through that part of the city. So for today's episode, we decided to have a conversation about urban well-being and safety. and spoke to Dr. Kalpana Vishwanath who is the founder and CEO of Safety Pin a social enterprise that uses technology and data to advocate for gender inclusive urban spaces and mobility Dr. Vishwanath is a part of the Delhi government women safety committee and has worked as a consultant with UN women and the UN habitat I am Vaishnavi Shukla and this is Architecture of Center a podcast where we highlight unconventional design perspectives, practices and research projects that reflect emerging discourses within the design discipline and beyond. Architecture of Center features conversations with radical designers, thinkers and change makers who are redefining the way we live and interact with the built environment. The first thing I want to do today is think through the idea of safety with you. having been born and raised in india and for women in countries like india i think there's a widespread notion amongst families that their daughters are safe only when they are at home resulting in restriction of movement of women for years even if it is only at a certain time of the day whereas due to the unfortunately high number of cases of domestic violence it seems that there is no real safe even for women either at home or outside and from my understanding i don't know the way i've been thinking about it seems like there's a certain hierarchy in terms of how we experience safety i don't know if there's a proper demarcation or classification of safety with something that kind of borderlines personal safety or communal safety or urban safety what do you think about just safety very broadly speaking Yeah um yeah good morning Vaishnavi I think that's a good question because you know it's um often been just uh, it's often understood in a I think a limited sense uh, it's sometimes it's just seen as security almost at other times there is this whole thing of you know women safety and it's only seen uh, outside in public spaces as you say then women's movements are restricted um i think you know for me what we need to what i over time recognize that we need to uh, make the linkage is safety is in fact must be seen as a almost as a fundamental right because safety has its impact or the lack of safety or the lack of the perception of safety has a very dire impact on the lives of women So for me the lack of safety doesn't only result in violence the lack of safety results in restrictions on your right as a citizen so you know to go out to access um, education opportunities to access employment uh, certainly to access leisure so you know if we link it to the larger concept of urban well-being I think the lack of safety and the lack of perception of safety has an impact on that. Now I think in India and in South Asian cultures the um and and others uh, there is um there are a lot of restrictions on women's movements women's ability to move around and mobility because it's very strongly linked to notions of honor. you know so mm. when you know when when in a when a particular case of violence takes place outside there is still often times um a tendency to keep it silent to you know restrict women's movements after that so we we have heard of many cases where young women say that they don't tell their families even if they face sexual violence outside because they know the result of that will be only rest- further restrictions on them mm. you know so really the odds are all stacked against women and especially young women you know 
because this whole old notion of honor, you know, if something happens, her marriage, her reputation, the family's reputation. The question of purity, I guess. Yeah. So, you know, so there is an entire, I think, uh, network of anxiety that gets built around, uh, you know, maintaining a, a girl's or a woman's honor. Having said that, um, the flip side of it is exactly what you said, that neither is the home a safe space for women, right? But that doesn't get taken into consideration so much in terms of honor because, you know, it doesn't seem to bother anyone's honor if a woman is facing uh, domestic or intimate partner violence, right? So it's really seen as something that you, you sort of um, just brush under the carpet, but it's not, um, uh, you know, it's... It's not focused on as much in, in, in terms of restricting. Like, for example, a young a woman may be married, face violence, and when she comes to her family, they just say, you know, please try again, adjust, do what he says, do what your in-laws say. So in both cases, you know, the reporting is less. Having said that, I mean, I, I think um, the, it has changed a lot in the past seven, eight years. So I wouldn't say that, you know, I, we are seeing more and more uh, families coming out and reporting, supporting their daughters. So I, I don't think it's a static uh, thing. Uh, I do think lots of changes are taking place. I think young women are insisting on their rights. And I think families are supporting them more and more to come out and report at least a little bit. So, you know, so I think safety is linked to mobility, it's linked to rights, it's linked to honor, it's linked to family, it's linked to a whole lot of things, which really complicates it and makes it a kind of complex web of interactions that we need mm. to um, engage with when we talk about safety. Hmm. I want to get into the, uh, the genesis or the origin story of how the organization safety been um, came into being. But uh, before that quick question, I think something that really struck me was the the idea of urban well-being. I think we don't think about it that often or we don't use the term that often. And I'm wondering if safety at the end of the day is somehow directly related to crime. I don't know. Is it a subconscious uh, cause and effect relationship that, you know, if a place is only safe if there's less crime or if there's more crime, the place is unsafe. Would you say they are directly kind of proportional to each other? You know, actually, not necessarily, because a lot of it is also linked to perception, right? So if you feel a place is unsafe, like, for example, a sort of a deserted street, even if there's never been a reported crime on that street, you will feel unsafe because it's a deserted street, right? So there are many elements that lead to a perception of lack of safety. For example, uh, the city of Delhi, right? Uh, the perception, you know, post the Nirbhaya case and other things is that it is an extremely unsafe place. Women can't go out. But in reality, if you look at the lives of women who live in the city, it's not that... Uh, I mean, it's not as if women don't access the city. It's not as if women don't go out at night. It's not as if women are not working. It's not as if women are not taking Ubers back at 12 o'clock at night from the airport. It is in that sense a big city. And we all live like big city uh, uh, citizens in this city also. Uh, so, you know, I think, um, you know, for example, after Nirbhaya case, we were told that many fam parents said they will not send our daughters to Delhi for for the studies. <laughs> Mine right. included. Yeah. Now, Delhi uh, probably has the best educational institutions in this country, right? And it's not that it became more unsafe in December 2012, right? It's just the perception changed in that year. It was always seen a little, little bit unsafe, but, you know, you were you know, balanced it and you got a good education here. And, you know, many people got through life without too many mishaps. But after that, you know, it just became this perception that, you know, we should not send our girls to Delhi. And that then becomes a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy, unfortunately. And I think uh, that's why I talk about well-being, because 
I think when you don't have safety, when you don't feel safe, you it impacts many aspects of your life. Like you not feel comfortable enough to take a cab. You don't feel comfortable enough to sit in a park. You don't feel like a young woman in a low-income neighborhood may not be able to go for an evening tuition class. So it actually impacts your entire sense of, um, you know, I would say even right to the city, but also a sense that you, you know, you own this place. You can, you can do whatever you want to do, and I think that is where I, I bring in the notion of well-being. That we have to think twice before doing anything, which you know I think very few men have to. I don't think they recognize how much we have to think before we step out in some. You know? So, so this is this is the perfect segue into the work you do now. Putting everything that we just spoke about kind of in the in the foreground. How did you start Safe to Pin? Uh, what is what is its uh, origin story? So, um, I have been working on the issue of. Uh, women's safety and um, gender inclusive spaces for many years I mean, well before i started safety pin i was working with jagodi i've worked at international projects i've worked with women in cities international on several un projects um so what happened uh, was you know in 2013 one of the things was you know we we used this tool called the safety audit uh, for many many years you know in india but as well as in cities across the world uh and it's a very simple tool uh which is very empowering you know because women go out and um they look at the public space and they they tell they sort of record why they feel safe or unsafe or where they feel safe or unsafe and then you start unpacking why and then you're able to implement changes so it's a kind of a very um simple um tool which records which documents which assesses and which empowers the person who actually does it because we really found that women said just the act of standing on a street with a notebook and pen and looking at it in in the evening to see what makes you safe and unsafe is is an empowering act so the tool had been used a lot and in 2012 2013 you know my co-founder and i um who he is the kind of the technology brain behind safety pin not me i know i'm not a technology person so we have been discussing the um idea of safety pin uh for i mean the idea of you know how do we take the safety audit and make it much more widely available to people so in 2012 13 there was also the post nirbhaya case there was a lot of um, awareness there was a lot of interest there was a lot of um talk about women's safety so we sort of said okay this is and you know apps for becoming the way to do everything so what we thought is let's try and make the safety audit into an app and then you know just put it out there and then women can do safety audits women can see all the safety audits and thereby they're able to access the city with greater information and data uh, which in itself can be an empowering act you know so it was really you know while at that time if you uh, remember there are many many emergency apps so women's safety was linked to emergency only right when you're in a situation of danger press a button press a button i mean to me that really reflected a you know a, a lack of imagination of what it is women really want you know so our idea was really how do you put something in the hands of women which will allow them to actually continue to occupy public space rather than recede from it or only fear it mm. right and mm. i think that's where it this thing we started off as just putting it together and building an app but we got support you know the idea was like and we got support to actually build it pilot test it launch it uh, so we had support from the uk aid and hindustan times and the like local newspaper supported us by advertising it so it just suddenly took off you know i mean honestly we started it, you know thinking we'll just put make an app and put it out there but uh, we actually found people really uh, like the idea were willing to try it were willing to experiment with it and so uh, we launched it in on november 13th uh, 2013 uh in a in a way, in an event and you know it was well used after that it was um the delhi government approached us and so it just you know uh, as you know then then it just yeah then the rest of it became history without us i would say consciously <laughs> planning it that way 
While on the topic of safe cities, in our next episode, we speak to Dr. Lindsay Asquith from the University of Technology, Sydney, about their research initiative called Designing Out Crime. Most crime problems, they haven't really changed over time. You know, we still are dealing with a lot of the same crime issues, but we have, through time, we've been using the same solutions. So maybe more and more CCTV, maybe more policing. Um, and so by actually really going beneath what was on the surface and looking at underlying and mm. seeing where we could use design to intervene, to change behavior, really, um, that was the fundamental thing. Catch us back here in two weeks. For now, let's resume our conversation with Dr. Vishwanath. I, I do want to get into um, some more specifics of, of the app. So in a way, I don't know if I was to summarize it in one sentence, which one should not do. It's it's almost crowdsourced mapping, if if that's the right way to uh, put it. Um, so if we think of Safety Pin as um, you know, a tool that uses mapping as a method to capture experiences of women in cities and then deploys data as a tool to arrive at a set of action-oriented changes. Um, can you tell us more about the app, the criteria that it uses to capture specific data points and how the resultant changes have led to safer public spaces? You did mention um, light as one of the criteria. What are some of the others? So as I said, we use a methodology called the safety audit, which measures, uh, assesses both physical infrastructure as well as the nature of the usage of the public space. So we look at lighting, we look at the walkability, how open it is, uh, whether there's public transport close by. But we also look at, um, you know, eyes on the street. So is it a is it natural surveillance on the street? Is it an active street? You know, are there restaurants and cafes and street vendors and auto rickshaws? Uh, who occupies it? So we also measure, look at, you know, whether it's a male dominated space or whether there are women and children in the space. Mm. Uh, and the app also asks the perception of safety. How do you feel in this place? Uh, so, so that we can also try to build correlations between which parameters actually have a greater impact on safety. You know, and I'll give an example. For example, if you ask somebody, you know, oh, you feel so unsafe in the street, what do you think will make it more safe? They'll say, oh, well, there should be more policing. Oh, but in right, reality, yeah. they don't go to the police, they don't even this thing. So, you know, there's a kind of a set answer in our heads, which we, you know, and, and the safety audit tries to unpack it a little bit more by asking certain questions that are not so obvious. So the app then basically has this tool. So what you can do is as an individual, you can do a safety audit, you can see all the safety audits. And over time, we've developed. Um, it has several other features. You can also uh, see the safety score. You can also mm. see a safest route. So, if you want to walk somewhere or take a car or an Uber, you can see the you know which is the safer route based on the three routes that Google throws up. Uh, we also have in uh, in India something called a find support feature that gives you um, you know where are the nearest um, police stations women's uh, one-stop crisis centers, etc. Uh, we also have something called nearby places. So, you know, it tells you, suppose you have to wait somewhere and, you know, you don't, it's a slightly dark road. You just look around on the um, app, you can see where there would be better lighting, where there is a cafe, where there's an ATM or a hospital or a clinic. So there's more likelihood that there's activity, light, people in that area. So, the you know, the elements of it are really to try and, um, enhance women's ability to access public spaces. Um, so the, that is the My Safety Pin app. But Safety Pin as an organization actually has more than one app, um, which are then the other apps we have are really data collection tools, which supplement the crowdsource data that My Safety Pin um, uh, is able to generate. Uh, do you want to talk about one of your um, projects, maybe? Bangalore or Bogota, uh, whichever. Yeah, so I can maybe talk about Delhi and Bogota because these have been, the, I think, the our most sustained projects. So uh, in addition to the crowdsource data, as I said, we collect data in another other ways. 
one is uh, we use an app called Safety Pin Night, uh, whereby we actually send out cars in the city with an app on, mounted on the window, and images are generated of the city at every 50 meters. So what we're able to do that is we're able to do a kind of a large scale mapping of the entire city. Because when people do audits, you'll only get partial information. You'll get it in certain places. Right. You'll not get data in another place. And actually, a place which is more unsafe, it is very, it's less likely a woman is gonna take out a phone and do a safety audit, right? So. We had to supplement this crowdsourced data to get a much larger, uh, robust data set. So we collect this data um, on lighting, on all the parameters, through the images. So in Delhi, for example, our, for uh, one of the data collection uh, large scale we did in 2016, threw up the data point that there were around 7,800 7, dark spots in the city. That is where lighting was zero. There was no mm. lighting there. Uh, you know, not even ambient lighting. This data was actually given to the Delhi government. The Delhi government constituted a multi-stakeholder uh, committee, which had all the uh, stakeholders who look after lighting. Because it's not only one stakeholder in a city which looks after lighting, right? There's the right. municipality, there's PWD, there's the highway authorities. And they took our data, they, you know, gave it to each of the agencies. They had uh, three monthly meetings where they invited us also to come and explain the the data uh, and after two years uh, they actually asked us to do a second round of mapping of the city to uh, get a sense of was lighting improved uh, now two things happened one was actually lighting did improve it came down to nearly mm. 2500 dark spots in the city but wow. secondly they also asked us to then if you're mapping let's look at a whole lot of other things so we then we looked at um, walkability. We looked at last mile connectivity. We looked at areas outside liquor shops, outside schools, parks to measure safety and give recommendations on how to improve it. So our work with Delhi government has been quite consistent. In fact, during COVID, we also added the find support feature. And last year we launched in partnership with the Delhi government, you know, where all the resources for women in the city that the, that the city government has is on our app. You know, mm. it has been verified and it's on the app in one place. So you want to go to a one-stop crisis center, you want to go to a police station, whatever there is. So, you know, it's a combination of things, improving public space, improving information for women that we've been doing. The other, I think, uh, a quick example I'd like to give, which is really the work we did in Bogota. As early as 2013, the I had gone to Bogota for another conference when I presented Safety Pin, and they actually were very interested in it. And they took it upon themselves to translate the app into Spanish. And in actually, in uh, to April 2014, we launched the Spanish version of the app. That was a, hmm. only the second language. They then used that, um, they publicized it, they asked people to do <coughs> data collection. And they came up with a very interesting idea because as like we were saying, what, what we did in Delhi on lighting on the streets, they wanted to focus on the bicycle tracks in the city. Because mm. you might know that by um, Bogota has a very um, healthy network of bike paths. Yeah, yeah. So they wanted to map the bicycle paths. So they actually innovated on our technology, which was really exciting. Mm. Where, uh, whereas we had been using cars to, deploying cars to go and collect the data using the app, they said, let's do it on bicycles to map the bicycle lane. Right. So that was already interesting because one is a bicycle moves much slower. So the images we get are actually much clearer. Mm. Secondly, they mobilized the biking community themselves to do it. So they had a campaign and the secretary herself and the department, they themselves went out onto the streets with the bikers. They had a kind of a video. They had a campaign material. They had colors and the, the, the people who used the streets mapped it. And the data was given. And when we gave it back to them, they used it at that time to do things like decide where to put the bicycle stands, where to put CCTV cameras, and where to put improved lighting, where to link it to the bus stands and stuff like that. And they actually found that more women used the bicycle tracks. And again, they also came back to us in 2018 to do another round of audits, uh, this time to focus on different times of the day. You know, so both uh, in the afternoon as well as the evening, as well as the later evening, 
to see how does the usage of the public space differ at different times of the day. So, you know, it's an app which, you know, in a sense, we don't really hold any great IP to it. So we're really happy if people innovate and use it mm-hmm. as to how that community or that city needs it. So for us, Bogota, the experience has been very valuable. And like that, we've been, you know, it's been used in Papua New Guinea, it's been used in Colombo, and during COVID, we actually linked it up to whether COVID had changed the nature of public space for women. Mm. We've done work in Latin, uh, Buenos Aires, Sao Paulo, Hanoi. So we've really worked in cities across the world, as, as well as across India. We've worked in many tier two cities. We're trying to do some work in even smaller cities in Haryana currently. Uh, we're doing some work in, across four cities in Rajasthan. But really, every time we build a kind of a local uh, network, partnership, so that it's a sustainable process. It's not that Safety mm. Pin themselves is setting up an office in every country, but we really try to activate a local network uh, to use the data, to help collect the data, to help advocate with the government to make the changes so that it becomes a more sort of a co-created and sustainable process. Hmm. I, I, I do want to talk to you a little bit about data because... Um, you use data extensively in different contexts for different applications. And if you think about, say, data and safety, what we're talking about right now is almost uh, in, in the broader scheme of like the crime cycle at a prevention stage. We're trying to really create public spaces to avoid, say, accidents or to avoid uh, rapes or, or whatever, whatever that is. Do you think... Uh, there is some kind of a scope to use data in crime alleviation. I wouldn't say alleviation, maybe just um, crime deterrent, because that's that's been my question throughout the season is, you know, we're looking at questions of violence, crime and justice. And if you think about crime, it, it seems like because we live in a heterogeneous society and if crime is an inherent part of a society, it, it's never really going to go away. I think it's only going to exist in different shapes and forms. Uh, what do you think about the role of data in, in deterring crime, it, it, especially when it comes to uh, large urban spaces or cities at a scale? Or what would that future look like? How would we use data? You know, I think um, there's so much today, right? There's machine learning, there is, uh, you know, large-scale mapping. There's drone uh, imagery that we're going to mm-hmm. be able to access. There's uh, artificial intelligence, you know. Uh, I think um, the way that data is going to be coming to us is, is significantly changing also, you know. And we need to be able to harness and deploy some of that as well. For example, you know, when we started... Uh, safety pin, we tried to see if there was public domain data available, right? Now, the satellite data did not, um, was too far. We couldn't actually see the city properly. Not satellite data that's available in public domain. I'm sure yeah. security agencies have much better satellite data. Then when we went to Google, uh, Google, again, you know, there is street view, but it's limited, right? It's limited to some countries and limited to certain time periods. Uh, it's also, you know, um, often in the daytime, not at night time. So the cities change during different times of the day and night. Sure. So in that sense, drone footage will actually give access to a lot, very much more sort of, um, what do I say, granular data that we were not able to access easily. Uh, easily. So I'm thinking in a few years, we should be able to get this footage much easier. So we don't need to actually send out cars to collect data. Secondly, uh, machine learning. So for example, even what we are doing, so the image analysis that we used to do, that we started doing manually, we have now um, uh, done machine learning on some of it, right? So exactly, especially lighting, the availability of a pavement, etc., cetera, uh, the nature of usage of the street, we are able to do quite a bit of it through machine learning now. Now, how does it help? Because, I mean, I think you're right. I mean, crime is not going to go away, right? And crime, but how do you manage it? How do you... Uh, ensure that there is justice done. So, for example, you know, I had a conversation with a police officer recently who themselves, they realized, they said, you know, the CCTV camera is not really a preventive of crime, but 
it yeah. does act a way help the police solve a crime after it's happened right. you know so i think um, if you look at the cct camera from that perspective rather than continuously talk about how it prevents crime uh, and recognize its limited usage and use it for that that becomes one way of um, i think um, of doing it secondly i think um, you know if you have a faith in the criminal justice system that it will yeah. deliver for you that is another big area which we need to work on right and this is not just data data is part of it but it's like really building that trust mm. uh building the sense that you know if you should go and report it is going to come to its logical conclusion you uh, there will be justice most likely there will be good investigation so i think even building that ecosystem that sense that you know where um we recognize that there is the urban say uh, agencies there is the transport there is um the re- response against violence against women there's a criminal justice system and all of it go together as well as the education system that go together to build a a, mm. a kind of a culture where violence against women is not tolerated is not accepted uh not at the micro level not at the macro level not in the family not at the workplace and uh, so you know there is no magic bullet there is no quick answer um we have to do the hard uh, painstaking work to reach yeah. that goal yeah <laughs> yeah and and what i also appreciate about um your tools and your method is that while satellite imagery and drones are great i still feel like they are uh, objective data but when you're talking about perception when you're talking about intuition you know when you walk in a certain place you just like intuitively feel like it's uh, fishy you know um so that level of just like subjective data uh I I think is something that maybe in like different layers of data collection should figure and I don't know I'm <laughs> terrible with data myself zero knowledge but it just feels like uh, what you feel in certain spaces is kind of supersedes what a drone yeah. image would uh, no, absolutely i think a lot of the big uh, data companies think that big data alone can can solve the problems mm. and i completely agree we have to have a combination we have to use big data strategically um but you know uh, you have to um, have the bottom up community level yeah. data production qualitative data exactly. all that to supplement that to actually truly make um uh, have transformative change otherwise it will be very superficial changes that you do mhm so big question after big data <laughs> what is next for safety pin where where do you go from here and if you want to talk about any interesting projects in the pipeline i think there are many interesting things ahead for us one is that you know so we've had the safety audit which is really looking at public space but what we are trying to do is we recognize that while that is very important if we really want to build what we call a gender friendly city Uh, mm. there are a lot of other indicators that need to be looked at you know urban policies availability of services so we're actually now in the process of trying to build a slightly broader indicator uh, so one is a safety audit but we also want to be able to have a kind of a tool which says you know these are this is what would make a city gender friendly mm. now like like we're doing now with safety audit in a public space we want to make it a broader tool to say how do you build gender friendly cities what are the set of indicators some of it you collect through secondary data some primary some qualitative surveys whatever it is and you come up with a kind of comprehensive um, way of uh you know making change at the macro and the micro level the second mm. thing i think is very important is that you know as we work more and more with city governments I feel the need that you know the building their capacity to work with data is something that's very much needed. Yeah. Many yeah. of them don't understand how to use the data. It's not that they don't want to. Uh so you know like you say you know they really big data they see they don't see the value of the crowdsourced data. I think you know mm. we need to build that capacity on both sides. Um you know I think that's it thirdly is to work with you know recognizing that even gender is an intersectional lens. 
I was just about to say that, yeah, it's very interesting how you mentioned gender and not just women, because uh, now increasingly with the awareness of people having and identifying with multiple gender identities, I think it's it's very interesting how you're trying to kind of extend that scope to people who don't necessarily identify as uh, so gender, but also other um, axes, uh, which can make you, you know, uh, d- excluded in a city. So now we're, mm-hmm. fact, we're doing a project in Rajasthan with young people and young people's well-being, urban well-being. Mm. With the focus on young women, but to look at that, then um, we've done some work on accessibility, you know, how do you make streets more accessible for all people? Then, of course, gendered as a more intersectional, but when I say intersectional, I even mean like, you know, it's not that all women experience a city in the same way. Sure. If you're a young person, if you're an older person, I know with lifespan expand, extending, many women being single as they grow older, how do we make a city that includes their needs and yeah. their uh, uh, elements, you know? So I think, you know, just uh, it's also important to constantly learn, constantly expand what we're doing and not sit and think, oh, we have found the answer. Mm. And I think that is... Um, so, yeah, these are the broad a- areas that I think we need to do more and more to... You know, because if our goal is to really make cities, transform cities, to make them places where people are not fearful, people do not only face violence, people are free to move around uh, with women at the center of that, but certainly recognizing that there are many others who are excluded from the, you know, from the table when cities are being planned and designed and, uh, and, and to sort of make sure that is an ongoing process. Knowing now that you have a meeting, uh, I really want to thank you uh, for taking time out and being with us here today and also give a big shout out to Malika who made this happen. Thanks, Vaishnavi. Special thanks to Ayushi Thakur for the research and design support and Kahan Shah for the background score. You can send in guest suggestions to our Instagram account, Arc of Center or through our website, arcofcenter.com. That is A-R-C-H-O-F-F-C-E-N-T-R-E. Thanks for listening.